On a moonless night in January, 1942, a single unreceived radio signal set in motion a catastrophe. The USSS-26, a veteran submarine departing Balboa for its patrol station after an earlier war patrol with no enemy damage, was struck and sent to the bottom of the Gulf of Panama in minutes. Only three men thrown from the bridge survived the initial impact. This is the story of that collision, the desperate rescue attempts, and the submarine that remained a silent war grave for 75 years until modern technology finally revealed its final resting place. The answer begins at 10.15 p.m., January 24, 1942. The unseen messenger that set everything in motion was a brief visual order in the dark. Four submarines, S-21, S-26, S-29, and S-44, slipped away from Balboa, their silhouettes erased against the moonless sea, running on the surface toward the Gulf of Panama. The patrol craft, PC-460, escorted the group. Built in 1930, as the 154-foot, 380-ton yacht Elda by Consolidated Shipbuilding in Morris Heights, New York. She had been acquired by the Navy in 1940 from Arthur Davis of New York City and converted into a patrol craft to shepherd coastal waters now alive with wartime traffic. As the column moved seaward, PC-460's commander judged the formation clear of the lanes. At 22.10, a message flashed from her signal lamp toward the submarines. The message said that this ship was 14 miles west of San Jose Light. It said submarines should proceed on duty assigned. It said this ship would make a wide turn to the right. It was precise and unambiguous. Only S-21 acknowledged. For S-26, S-29, and S-44, the signal never effectively arrived. Wartime protocols demanded redundancy, radio, visual, and acknowledgement. But 1942 technology and conditions often conspired against certainty. The S-boat's radios were built around vacuum tubes, such as the RC-ACE-10 transmitter and LB-series receivers, and they were prone to interference, saltwater corrosion, and fragile components. Running lights were blacked out for stealth. In that environment, a single missed visual exchange could become a void. The three submarines held station, unaware they had been released. They continued in a tight, dark formation, maintaining course and speed with no navigation lights and no expectation that their escort would swing back across their track. PC-460, satisfied the order had been sent and presuming dispersal, began her wide turn to starboard to return toward port, just as her signal had promised. What happened next unfolded in minutes. Testimony and logs reconstruct the geometry, a patrol craft executing a wide right turn, submarines ahead, steady on course, no shared awareness that their paths would intersect. On the bridge of Esta 26, the officer of the deck and lookouts scanned the horizon for hazards and enemy contacts, not for their own escort doubling back across their bows. The distance closed quickly, erasing options with each passing second. The chain was simple, a message sent, an acknowledgement missed, a formation maintained, a routine turn executed. The consequences would be anything but routine. What followed was governed by simple mechanics and unforgiving geometry. It was the physics of a catastrophe. The collision was a violent structural failure. PC-460's sharp bow struck S-26 on its starboard side at the torpedo room forward of the control spaces. That section included main ballast tanks that were critical for surface buoyancy. Steel met steel at speed and the combined momentum of both vessels drove a concentrated blow that opened the hull. Inside the submarine, the event was instantaneous and brutal. A violent lurch threw men against bulkheads and equipment. The sound of rending metal raced through the pressure hull, a deafening signal of a breach. 
seawater began a torrential influx through the ruptured plating. S-26 was built to endure external pressure at operating depths and distant concussions, but a direct penetration concentrated force on a small area the structure could not resist. Flooding pushed past frames and fittings and into the forward spaces. The water came fast. It knocked crewmen off their feet and smothered electrics, throwing compartments into darkness within seconds. Trim vanished. Control surfaces and buoyancy reserves could not counter the sudden loss of volume forward. With the forward torpedo room compromised and adjacent spaces taking water, the bow grew heavy. The submarine pitched down and began to plunge. There was no time to stage a controlled response, no time to rig for collision control or to set additional watertight boundaries beyond what was already secured for night steaming. From impact to submergence, the sequence played out in a few seconds. Witnesses in the water later described a rapid, almost immediate disappearance. An 854-ton surface combatant that had been tracking seaward moments earlier slipped under before orders could circulate or equipment could be manned. For the three men thrown from the bridge, there was only the sight of the hull angling down and the sudden absence where S-26 had been. For those below, steel doors and dogging wheels became the last lines between compartments that were filling and others that still held air. What remained after the plunge was darkness, cold water, and sealed hatches. The next phase of this story moves from impact to endurance, from kinetics to survival behind steel. Below the waterline, the men who remained alive faced a new kind of battle, trapped in the operating compartment. For the three survivors thrown from the bridge into the sea, the immediate horror was watching the submarine vanish. 46 crewmen did not return. Among them were two officers, including the commanding officer. Among the three survivors, one was an enlisted man. For those trapped below, sealed hatches became an absolute barrier. The standard practice of securing the conning tower hatch during surface operations, sound in ordinary dangers, now locked the crew below decks inside a submarine that was plunging. The central operating compartment, containing the control room and likely the station for many during the transit, became the focus of hope and then despair. The conning tower's raised structure above it created a fatal complication. No rescue vessel could make a watertight seal directly over the main access to the men below. A buoy ejected from a signal gun reached the surface. Its message was precise. The forward and after ends of the submarine, which contained the compartments fitted for rescue work with the diving bell, were flooded and the surviving members of the crew were in the central operating compartment. That note set off a rapid response. Salvage ships converged. Divers descended through dark water to a wreck upright on the seabed, about 300 feet down. Bottom time was short. They went first to the bridge hatch. There they found a grim sign of life. At least one crew member had survived long enough to close the bridge hatch, which stubbornly resisted efforts to reopen it. The act bought precious AIR for the spaces below, but denied the divers immediate entry. Rescuers prepared the McCann rescue bell, the Navy's hard-won answer to submarine entrapment. But the S-26 conning tower design predated the bell. Owing to the structure of that class, it was not possible to use the rescue bell over the central compartment, even if the ship had been located in time. The bell had been developed years after this type was built. Across 25 rescue attempts, teams tapped the hull and listened for an answering signal. None came. Pressure, depth, and geometry held the line. By the time the operation was suspended, the mission's tone had shifted. What remained was respect for a site sealed in silence and the recognition that its story would stand apart waiting for the day it would be formally marked and remembered. From that point forward, the watch shifted from frantic action to long remembrance, the silent watch. After the rescue efforts were formally abandoned, 
the USS S-26 received its final designation, a war grave. This official status signaled the Navy's commitment to preserving the submarine and its contents as the final resting place for the 46 crew members. The site would remain undisturbed, upright in 300 feet of water in the Gulf of Panama. For decades, the story lived in naval archives and in the memories of veterans and families, a somber note from the early chaotic months of the Pacific War. S-26 had previously made one war patrol, but had inflicted no damage on the enemy, and her service ended before she could strike back. Modern underwater technology made a disciplined search possible. Systematic surveys for lost World War II submarines advanced with autonomous underwater vehicles and side-scan sonar. The autonomous underwater vehicles could run pre-programmed grids at depth building high-resolution maps of the seabed, while wide-swath side-scan sonar flagged targets for closer inspection. The Lost 52 project, in formal collaboration with the Naval History and Heritage Command, focused those tools on the Gulf of Panama, aligning historical track lines with search boxes. Tim Taylor, Chief Executive Officer of Tiburon Subsea and the Lost 52 project, led the effort that produced the sonar data the Naval History and Heritage Command used to confirm multiple U.S. submarine wrecks, including S-26. The breakthrough came when the returns from the autonomous underwater vehicles outlined a clean, man-made profile. The images resolved into the distinctive shape and dimensions of an S-Class hull. The wreck lay upright and intact in 300 feet of water, its posture consistent with a rapid plunge following collision rather than an internal detonation or a depth charge event. That condition offered more than confirmation. It preserved evidence, the overall integrity of the pressure hull, the bow-down attitude, and the lack of breakup consistent with the documented impact forward on the starboard side. The images gave investigators and families alike a fixed point in the deep, ending decades of uncertainty. For families, the identification brought closure commensurate with 75 years of waiting. For historians, it verified the record and underscored the site's protected status. The wreck of the USS S-26 is not an archaeological dig, but a war grave, a permanent memorial preserved by the deep. What endures now is the lesson carried by that silent hull, a reminder of how small failures can cascade at sea. In that quiet, the conclusion is clear and measured. The loss of the United States ship S-26 stands as a stark lesson in the compound risks of naval operations. Darkness, miscommunication, and the vulnerability of a surfaced submarine converged with catastrophic speed. The wreck rests about 14 miles west of San Jose Light, in 300 feet of water in the Gulf of Panama, a designated war grave protected in place. Its story endures as a silent memorial to the 46 men who gave their lives. The site represents the final resting place of sailors who served the nation, and should be respected by all parties as a war grave.